Our next public hearing has to do with the zone text and maxim map amendment for chapter 1254 of the codified ordinances pertaining to development standards for downtown. Mr. Kohler. This is also a zoning text amendment that is coming as a recommendation of planning commission and you do have legislation uh, pursuant to this on your agenda. Uh, this is a pretty significant overhaul of our zoning ordinance, uh, particularly for uh, the downtown. This comes as a recommendation of our city's master plan and recognizes that downtown has a changing role and that uh, when the zoning ordinance was written in 1968, uh, people viewed downtown very much differently from the way they do today. The master plan strategies are to promote a synergistic land use mix, and by synergistic meaning that the combined uses of things like residential, commercial, office, places to work, places for recreation, combined together in one zone classification create sort of a symbiotic relationship that actually reinforces each other and it becomes a greater economy because of those varied uses. Also, uh, it's to preserve and enhance the unique sense of place that we find in a downtown versus a suburban type shopping setting. And also the downtowns remain the center of a community in terms of its arts, culture, and entertainment. Uh, one of the key uh, things that is going to change with this uh, amendment to the zoning code is that we're reintroducing residential uses into downtown. And we're also looking at concentrating the retail uses on the major thoroughfares. A hundred years ago, downtowns functioned very differently. Uh, because we were somewhat a pedestrian-oriented society, everything was built in very high density, and there was very little uh, allowances for automobiles. We had uh, stores with owners living above. We had very mixed land uses. And quite honestly, it developed with no zoning code at all. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was a very rich mix. <clears throat> Back in the 1960s and 70s, things changed with suburbanization. And the thought behind our zoning ordinance and behind our, our redevelopment strategies, uh, and many other communities kind of fell into this, is to try to make downtowns function as a suburban shopping center. Uh, and because of that, it was believed at that time that residential development has no part of being in a downtown and should be separated from downtown and that we should make downtown uh, an automobile oriented type of development that we encourage big setbacks big parking lots and and um, that that was the trend the study area that we chose to look at at the recommendation of our master plan is, are the commercial zones which surround what is currently known as the Central Business District, or CBD. We have four Central Business District classifications, CBD 1 through 4. This proposal would actually replace all four of those classifications. The current CBD 1, which is probably more akin to what we're proposing as the urban core district, only covers about a five, six block area uh, surrounding the central and broad street intersections. That's the area shown in white on your map. Uh, that particular zone classification is purely commercial um, and office type uses, no residential permitted. Uh, it does allow for zero setbacks, meaning that buildings can be built right to the sidewalk. The second classification, CBD2, is very similar to our professional office classifications. It is office, um, uh, uh, nonprofit organization type uh, uses, and we only have a couple areas that are in the immediate vicinity of the CBD1, and that's in the slightly light gray. The next shade of darker gray is CBD3 of the Central Business District Zone. That one is exclusively residential, and that is the area that's included in the Trinity Apartments. 
Uh, again, I think the thought was we had to keep the residential separate from the commercial. And so that was set up as a separate zone classification. And then the CBD4 is a transition zone into community shopping. And CBD4 and C4, which you see in the red on your map, are intended to be more suburban shopping center in that you build the buildings back from the street, uh, the parking goes in the front, and it, it resembles more of a, a suburban versus downtown feel to it. Uh, the other zone classifications in the study area include I-1, uh, which is industrial, I-2 is in the immediate vicinity but not included. Uh, D-3 is in the area surrounding uh, P-1 and P-2, which are professional office zones, are both included in the area, such as the school administrative offices, uh, the Vale School, and actually the Sorg Mansion is zone P-2, which is a professional office zone. And then C-2 on the fringe, C-4, uh, which is the area between Clark or uh, Curtis Street and the railroad tracks. Uh, that C4 is our most common uh, commercial zone classification that we see throughout the community. This is the actually uh, from the master plan illustrating that commercial uh, it's recommended to be concentrated on the major thoroughfares being Central Avenue and Route 4 being the north-south axis and to a minor degree on Central or on uh, Main Street and that residential uses be filled in on the edge. The conclusion of the master plan, which had a market study component to it, was that there is not enough, um, well, the, the amount of retail and office zoning that we currently have in place in the downtown area is more than the market will support. And we see that in terms of the vast number of vacancies that we have downtown. The recommendation is to create cohesion in that commercial development that it be focused on the primary thoroughfares where you have the most traffic and it has the most um, uh, propensity to, to, um, to exceed or, or to, uh, to work well on those zones. Um, again, the new districts are the urban core, urban central, which is very similar to our current central business district, with the exception that we're encouraging uh, residential development on the upper floors only within that uh, district. And the UCS, which is the urban core support, which allows for commercial development uh, in the form of offices and very low intensity commercial and allows for residential on both the street level and upper levels. In the study area, the existing zoning, uh, <coughs> noting that uh, these are the major thoroughfares, traffic patterns within downtown, and those are the areas where we're uh, proposing to concentrate the uh, commercial. Uh, the USC, is uh, again the outlying portions and the UCC being the core areas. Um, <coughs> in terms of permitted uses in the urban core, which is the most permissive of the zones, it allows for retail services, eating, drinking, establishments, entertainment, offices, institutional, recreational, automotive, residential only on the upper floor and the expansion of non-conforming uses and we will have a few non-conforming uses and those are primarily the somewhat industrialized uses that either predate zoning or were allowed as trade shops under the old C4 zone classifications. The USC does not permit retail, only a limited amount of services, no eating and drinking or restaurants, um, offices mostly are permitted, institutional are permitted, recreational, or some are permitted but not the high intensity. Um, automotive, parking lots only, uh, and residential, all kinds of residential being a multifamily, single family, etc. This is the proposed zoning with the white being the proposed urban core district central and the remainder of that being the uh, support district. 
the objectives in this design regulation um, is that we present or preserve and enhance a unique sense of place within downtown and that it be pedestrian friendly. Uh, as we've noted in successful downtowns, uh, pedestrians tend to create the greatest amount of retail and office trade. Uh, and those are accommodated by trying to bring the actual buildings as close as possible to the street where the people are, uh, where the traffic and the activity, it gives a sense of something going, uh, that there's something going on in downtown. Also, we're proposing uh, a new thing for downtown that we have design regulations. Oh, a couple of years ago, we did adopt sign regulations for downtown, but this particular ordinance actually has facade regulations that pertain only to new construction or modifications to buildings. None, nothing that is included in this code is retroactive in that it does not mandate that existing property owners or existing businesses do anything to conform to this code. And that's an important point that we try to stress, that this only comes into play when people are looking to substantially expand a business or locate a new business into downtown. Um, all existing exterior changes being signed, sidewalks, uh, items, must have the approval from the Council on Landmarks and Historic Districts. This is a current council that uh, that was formed to govern the South Main Historic District. We sort of debated back and forth who should have the design review of downtown, whether it be the current architectural review board that does the residential, or we use the current one, or do we create a new one. Since the Council on Landmarks and Historic Districts meets fairly infrequently, and it only pertains to the South Main Historic District, we decided to recommend using that group as the design review for downtown. Another added benefit is that two blocks of South Main are already incorporated in this, um, in this historic district or in the downtown district. So there's actually an overlapping of the design review. Uh, in terms of building location, there is no minimum setbacks and no front setbacks are permitted in the urban core district. The only exclusion to that is if someone wants to do outdoor dining or some uh, sort of business activity in the front of the building that would uh, be enhanced if the building could be set back no more than 15 feet from the sidewalk. And that's very different from our commercial standards that actually currently mandate the buildings be set back from the street and not be built to the sidewalk. Um, and then in the support district, the residential zones, that the uh, setback be set at 15 feet back from the sidewalk. Again, this is new construction or substantial additions defined as more than 50% of the gross floor area. Just as illustrations, um, for instance, when Dublin House was built, that was required to be set back from the sidewalk. I think they actually exceeded those requirements. But what it does is it creates sort of a void of space. And the sidewalk uh, in front of it just looks like it's, it's a mile long and there's nothing going on in that particular block. Versus if you bring the building to the block and you put business activity in close proximity to the street, it's a sign that there's um, uh, activity going on. Uh, this particular code encourages the actual use of the sidewalk by the businesses. Currently, our ordinances prohibit any business activity occurring on the sidewalk except for occasional sidewalk sales. Uh, this would actually encourage that. Um, the design standard says that there must be at least one main entry door on every primary frontage. Now, most buildings are on Central Avenue or on the main street. Um, only <coughs> buildings that are on the corners of major thoroughfares would be required to have multiple entries. Um, and that's, again, for new construction additions and renovations. Um, we look at issues like horizontal scale uh, to encourage more multi-floor construction, a variety of uses of material, breaking up facades with things like windows and architectural elements. Uh, the material standards actually would prohibit things like corrugated metal as a um, 
primary siding and that you cannot just have blank walls that would face a public street without doors, windows, or architectural elements. These uh, vertical piers would need to be every 15 to 35 feet along the building frontage. Again, only for um, building frontages greater than 50 feet and only in new construction activities. Ground floor transparency has been noted as a uh, key factor in promoting business activity that when you see what's like on the uh, lower examples, when there are broad expanses of um, surfaces that you cannot see into the building, they don't tend to be pedestrian friendly. It almost makes you feel like they're, you're being walled in. Um, and it's, it's actually, um, in studies, it's been proven to be sort of a turnoff to pedestrian traffic. Uh, ground floor transparency means that non-tinted glass be on at least 60% of the ground floor of the primary frontage, and then on a corner that it be 10% around the corner. And that's also on new construction and in the urban core district only. 10% 10, 10 or 10 feet? Oh, the presentation said feet. 10, 10 feet, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, just 10% could Perfect. be. Okay, thank you. Catching that. Uh, the top example in this picture, I think I have a bigger one, um, is a uh, the existing building on the left, or pre-existing, was a historical building. The building on the right is a new building that was constructed within that district. Mm -hmm. It shows the elements that we're looking for in this design, that it has both vertical and horizontal elements. It has materials that blend in with the district. And even though it doesn't try to replicate a historic building, it fits in with um, the district. It has the, um, the windows, the entry, and those types of features. Uh, in terms of materials, natural masonry, wood, stucco, and fiber cement siding are the permitted. Prohibited as a primary use are vinyl, aluminum, steel siding, exterior, um, or insulated stucco. Um, and when I say primary, these materials, like the vinyl and aluminum, can be used as accent, but it cannot be the principal siding material in the downtown. Uh, the, what the design guidelines encourage is that you try to um, kind of spruce up, paint up, clean up the existing or pre-existing historical designs wherever possible. And that um, when windows are replaced, they'd be replaced with similar type windows uh, and that they, uh, the original architectural intent be kept intact. We will note that um, at the DART visit that we had last week proposed by Heritage Ohio, Heritage Ohio promotes using historical standards. And because that's part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Secretary of the Interior has historic design guidelines. Uh, we're not proposing to go the full extent of this being historic guidelines in the sense that you cannot use replacement windows, you cannot do certain modifications, and if you know what the original looks like, you have to match it. We're not proposing to do that. Uh, we're just proposing to use similar materials, similar design, recognizing that downtown needs to function as a modern, convenient type of uh, setting. Um, we have uh, preserve and restore uh, things like cornices, original materials, windows, piers, and storefronts and entrances that if those historical elements still exist, that the preference is that you try to work with those design elements. Uh, complementary uses of awnings are encouraged. Not only are they attractive architecturally, but they're another pedestrian friendly amenity provide shade, cover from rain. Uh, rear and side facades that they may be maintained in clean appearance. Uh, continue the front detailing on the rear of the buildings and create and preserve and restore the window openings that are on the rear of buildings. Keep in mind that in the downtown, the primary source of parking is at the backs of the buildings. And sometimes those back facades are the most ignored. Uh, for instance, these are some uh, rear facades. And while they have entryways to them, they don't particularly look inviting, uh, either for employees or for, uh, for customers. 
This is an example of uh, where there's actually a city parking lot and the building or the businesses um, have actually accessed those uh, properties to the rear and they become secondary entrances. Some of them have been enhanced with things like landscaping to also accentuate the parking. <coughs> yeah, they've cleaned up, spruced up the rear of the building so the customers feel welcome entering in from the back of the building if, if that's appropriate. Um, in terms of applicability of the renovation guidelines, it's uh, looking at changing styles and materials that we're not necessarily replicating like in a Disney World Main Street fashion, that we are looking to encourage um, creativity and architectural design, but they need to be somewhat in keeping with the, um, the urban feel of downtown. Um, nothing in this design ordinance prohibits people from doing regular maintenance, painting, um, in-kind replacement of materials when necessary. Those types of things would not have to go through a review. Um, also, secure adequate spaces for parking within 300 feet. Now, while the urban core district is actually mirroring the current CBD1 requirement that no parking is required within those zones, uh, we do look at things like how close those public lots are to the business or private lots are to the business. Being that space is very limited in downtown, it is more efficient to have collective parking facilities than to have each and every building try to provide their own parking. It just is much more efficient use of land. Uh, but that still needs to be within a reasonable distance of the, the new buildings. And that also comes into play only if we're building new buildings or if you're eliminating off-street parking spaces or um, doing changes to buildings that will drastically increase the amount of parking requirement. So for existing buildings, there is no requirement for um, doing additional parking. Um, the top example is what we try to encourage where, say, a building is built right to a corner, but the parking is around to the rear. It's still very accessible to that building. What we try to avoid are the uh, examples at the bottom where the parking is actually almost a barrier between the street and, and the building itself, that the parking needs to be encouraged to be at either the side or the rear of those buildings. Uh, and then up to 50%, uh, the parking location is that up to 50% be at the side of the building or at the rear of the building, and that is only for new construction of buildings. Haven't seen a lot of new construction. Uh, this uh, actually pertains almost more to public improvements, but in the case where the parking is in the rear and there is no customer entrance, a lot of times uh, the access to the front of the buildings is through the alleys, and sometimes those can be a little bit foreboding. There are instances where communities have taken those alleys and made them into pedestrian walkways that makes for a lot more pleasing connection with that parking uh, to the fronts of the building. Beautiful. Uh, for residential, uh, in many cases, uh, if we're trying to encourage people to live downtown, they're probably going to want to prefer to act, either have reserved parking spaces or parking garages. And this is an example where a building which was previously commercial, it was converted to residential, and they decided to add garages across the back as an amenity for those residences. And this would be permitted under the new zoning. Uh, this is an example, it's probably not pertinent for us, but even parking garages can be made to comply with the standards in terms of the vertical and horizontal elements, use of materials, that this, and it's built right out to the sidewalk, uh, so it really does fit in with an uh, urban environment. Uh, parking lots encourage uh, fence and wall constructed uh, around them with natural materials and the dumpsters being closed with <coughs> opaque materials. 
in encouraging uh, things like um, wrought iron fences, encourage, well, it actually prohibits the use of chain link fence, prohibits the use of barbed wire fence in downtown. Also, simply having bumper blocks between the sidewalk and the pedestrians and, and the cars um, is, is almost an uncomfortable situation. Another example where they used a combination of both brick and wrought iron to screen a parking lot. Uh, signs, uh, the recommendation is to utilize the existing sign standards. Uh, the one um, provision that we made when we did the sign ordinance is that we now allow signs that are mounted at right angles to buildings to extend over sidewalks. In the previous zoning, those were prohibited, but in a downtown setting, those are very pedestrian friendly because walking up and down the sidewalk, it's very difficult to see flat mounted signs on fronts of buildings. Uh, additional conditions uh, is to have uh, all commercial uses in enclosed areas, and except for seasonal sidewalk sales and outdoor dining. Uh, permitted as accessory uses in the UCC, uh, we can have outdoor dining. That's currently prohibited downtown. Uh, the conditions are that they, uh, whoever does the outdoor dining needs to carry insurance for it. The number of seating needs to be limited uh, to no more than 30% of what's inside. It actually needs to be an accessory use to a restaurant. Uh, for instance, an office building couldn't start selling food in front of their building, um, it would need to actually be accessory to a restaurant. Uh, no cooking or busing outside, no separate advertising, and it must be kept clean. Uh, here's some examples of very successful uses of outdoor dining. Uh, it creates a very, very relaxing, people-friendly environment for downtown. Um, the sense of place, pedestrian friendly, clear design standards, and the design review board are really the key things that will make that happen downtown. Um, am I going the right direction? Yeah, it seems like I'm repeat. Forward. I know I'm going the right there it is. I'm, unfortunately, we have just some repeats. Um, under arts and culture, uh, create an environment conducive to activities, encouraging pedestrian congregation and per permit <coughs> outdoor seating on sidewalks. Wow. I apologize, but I have a lot of repeat slides that got in, into this. Uh, here's a great example where they've used things like street trees, uh, awnings, benches, bike racks, uh, outdoor planters, uh, all these things really create a more human, uh, inviting environment versus a totally blank sidewalk with parking. Uh, another example, different community. Sometimes the use of banners on street signs creates sort of a festive downtown appearance. Can you see that? Uh, benches, uh, bike racks again. Uh, we've, I think, made some major strides in downtown. Uh, the city has actually installed some planter boxes. Uh, we have the farmer's market, uh, which is underway in the Governor Square, which is a great pedestrian-friendly uh, venue. Uh, we encourage things like outdoor entertainment to draw people downtown. Uh, the use of the public sidewalk with uh, tables with awnings for shade. Uh, we do propose that um, businesses downtown be allowed to have sidewalk signs or sandwich boards, uh, no more than four feet high, two feet wide, and no more than one per business. Uh, these are also a way of trying to draw uh, additional foot traffic into businesses. Uh, having events outdoors, while it's not a zoning issue, is kind of a part of this whole revitalization effort. Uh, Large-scale events like on the riverfront that bring people downtown also contributes to the success of downtown. Uh, one of our probably most problematic areas in terms of fitting in with this urban design is the area north Verity Parkway. Uh, 
in the sense that the market study has dictated or has uh, let us know how much reasonable expectation we have for commercial development on downtown, uh, we have a need to try to concentrate that retail as much as possible. This particular area on North Verity was built in a kind of classic suburban style, even though it is in close proximity to downtown. In terms of trying to bring it into a downtown and, and encourage buildings to be built right to the right of way in this section is probably not going to happen. Uh, it's heavily trafficked because we at this point have two-way traffic on Verity Parkway. Uh, and just the overall market demand is probably not there to have intense commercial development. The proposal under the master plan and also reflected in the zoning is to try to eventually transition this area into more of a residential and light office type of setting. Uh, one of the selling points is, particularly on the west side of Verity Parkway, is that we have the ability to tie into Smith Park to the rear and um, develop some quality housing that would use that as an amenity. Uh, this is also showing the other side of the street. This particular area, keep in mind, there is nothing to mandate that they change their mode of operation. It can continue as long as those buildings remain. Uh, but over time, uh, it, the preference is to try to bring back more residential uses that will create the rooftops to create the market demand for more uh, retail in the downtown area. Uh, just to show you a few examples, uh, this was a community we visited. This was a retail building that was converted to office on the first floor, residential on the second floor. Um, nearby community uses effective signage on, uh, on awnings throughout their business district. Uh, it's important to look at what a block face does when we have continuous rows of buildings. When buildings are torn down within a block face to create parking, it breaks up that continuity of a downtown. And uh, trying to keep those buildings built to the right of way creates a more uniform uh, retail uh, district. Uh, examples of signs that would not be permitted under our current zoning uh, are signs painted on rooftops or mounted to rooftops, even though that's not in downtown. Uh, this is a great example where they've used the color scheme of a building. They've retained all of its original architectural elements. Uh, they painted signs on the inside of the glass, which is a great way of doing things. They used a right angle sign. Uh, but they've, they've really enhanced the original architecture of this building. Uh, this was the slide I showed before of the uh, new building built next to the uh, existing building. Uh, this is another example of a building that was destroyed by fire and replaced in 1995. And the replacement building reflected the urban flavor of this particular downtown. Uh, in height, setback, and so forth. Uh, a lot of times when we do have buildings that are demolished within a block face, it creates a large expanse of sidewall that's viewed uh, by the public. Uh, this is an interesting instance in a, a community in Indiana where a building was actually demolished next to this building and they took that blank sidewall and built all of these storefronts new into the uh, sidewall. And it actually created more usable interior space uh, by doing that. This particular building, they also put uh, retail and office on the first floor and residential on the second floor. That parking garage I showed you in one of the previous examples was the rear of this building. Uh, another great example of what you can do with the large blank wall. And uh, thanks to the Community Foundation and others, we're going to have another one come up soon. In summary, uh, this is both a zoning text amendment to incorporate two new chapters, urban core, central, urban core support, and do a map amendment uh, to create the districts as you see on this particular slide. 
and it also repeals all of our current central business district zones. I know this is a lot of information to try to cover in a short period of time, understanding that when Planning Commission reviewed this, we broke it down into four separate components <laughs> and took it in fourths. So you're getting the whole thing in one lump sum. So if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Thanks. Yeah, Mr. Kohler, um, I just got a couple that the um, citizens and maybe council may want to know this. Um, you know, as I was involved, um, you know, as being the liaison to Planning Commission, and so is Mr. Amberg. But on the Urban Core Central, um, well, I mean, on the Urban Core um, Support District, uh, you know, and I've had a couple people ask me this also. Um, you know, we are not going to allow retail or no eating or restaurant. Uh, establishments and you know can you just take a minute to kind of explain why we felt that was important to to do that uh, several reasons uh, primarily we know that the amount of real estate that we currently have devoted downtown to commercial which allows eating drinking all those types of establishments is much more than the residents that support that district can provide. Um, th that's probably one of the primary reasons why we need to focus that in fairly confined areas, being the more uh, intense type uses. Uh, secondly, we have a need to try to encourage as many new rooftops, residential units within the area as possible. So that support district is considered to be sort of the fringe of downtown. It's not on the main highly trafficked streets like the Central Avenue, like the Route 4 North and South and parts of Main Street. So if we are to strategically place where these more intensive uses are going to be, it would make sense to put those uses on the most heavily trafficked thoroughfares. Well, I tried to explain to people that the reason we've done this or we're going to do this is you know we're we are trying to do that arts entertainment livability you know people living downtown and we need to concentrate the eating establishments and and so forth in our urban core mm -hmm. and uh but i know you know people have concern and it's like i've told some business owners you know we're not messing with your existing businesses anyone that's got an existing business we are not trying to put you out of business or messing with your existing business so you know i appreciate touching on that okay I also note that while this is a tool for revitalization of downtown it is by no means an automatic it is simply allowing certain things to happen that currently cannot happen um, in terms of strategy uh, the Downtown Economic Development Committee has I think, very wisely decided to try to focus their activity on about a 12-block area surrounding basically Broad Street, the former mall area. Uh, the idea behind focusing attention is to create energy that if we start spreading out uh, the areas of effort geographically, it doesn't provide that synergy, that, that area of activity and focus that we need to accomplish. So how we go about implementing economic development strategy while it's related to zoning uh, is a totally separate component. I have uh, one question on the applicability mm -hmm. for the changes where you're adding 50% of the floor space or new construction. Does that apply to both the UCC and the UCS areas or is it just the core? I just wasn't clear on that. It's, it's both. Applies to both. Yes. So any new construction in either district would be reviewed right. and have to meet the standards. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? One of the uh, items that uh, you are stressing is the outdoor dining and to encourage and you know, we've seen evidence of, of your pictures of where that could lead us to, you know, uh, the availability of outside uh, seating in, in the downtown area. Um, and you've set a, um, a no greater than 30 percent of the number of seats that are inside the, the restaurant to be outside. 
Uh, is that a standard number? Uh, where did that number come from? We, we used a lot of different zoning ordinances as formats for it. Mm -hmm. uh, we did find instances um, in almost every ordinance that does permit outdoor dining that it is a certain percentage of that indoor seating. Okay. Uh, there's nothing particularly magic about 30%. Uh, realizing that in our climate it's going to be seasonal at best anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just seemed like that was a common standard that was used. Okay. But again, it's a number. Uh, probably would not want to get to the point where you're exceeding your indoor capacity with outdoor yeah. dining. Sure, I understand. Um, would frontage be another way to, to tie that in? Because some restaurants that may be on a corner where have, may have limited seating inside but have an area outside that would be used accordingly to the you know, to the ordinances, but could really realistically fit more than 30% of their inside seating because they have a corner lot. Right. Would, would that be an exception that, that could be made? It, it could be. Uh, understand that there's two different types of outdoor <coughs> dining in this ordinance. There's outdoor dining, which is actually on the public sidewalk, in the case of the one in front of the um, uh, pharmacy building. That particular ordinance uh, says that you cannot block more than six feet of sidewalk. So that amount of outdoor dining is going to be somewhat restricted by the ability to keep pedestrian traffic on the sidewalk. Uh -huh. um, and then that cap of 30% also kicks in on that. There's also outdoor dining on private property. And that's if you have a restaurant with, say, a, a rear or even a side lot. Um, or front lot if they happen to have an existing building with a front yard. And then there's requirements on that as well. Mm -hmm. And we could probably look at, at both of those and see if there's other standards that might allow for more outdoor dining in specific situations that, um, that uh, we can certainly look into it and give you for the next meeting because this is a first reading, um, some additional possibilities. Okay, that, that would be good because you brought up the pharmacy. <clears throat> for instance, the pharmacy, you could, you could put tables all along that sidewalk on, on Broad Street if you chose to. Right. Which would be more than 30% of the inside seating. Right. So if, if there's some flexibility on places such as that, because I, I think we're going to run yeah. into that from time to time yeah. throughout the downtown. On the kind of flip side, for the businesses are on Central Avenue, the sidewalk is already only about eight feet wide. So if you've got to have six feet in pedestrian traffic, you're only going to be able to have narrow tables right adjacent to the building. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's kind of a luxury having that extra wide sidewalk on Broad Street, mm -hmm. which is not typical of downtown. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can bring us back some language that might sure, take that consideration. That. Any other questions or comments? With, with the rezoning um, proposal, uh, Mr. Kohler, the, the issue is to give more flexibility to those who are looking at this area, potential business owners or... Um, to a certain extent, the, the somewhat sticking area that Currently, our, our ordinance does not allow people to put things like planter boxes or benches or the sidewalk signs. Unfortunately, the examples that I showed you, all of those are illegal right now. We haven't really enforced it because we realize that the downtown plan is trying to encourage that type of activity. Um, but it, it would make those uses not illegal. And then, uh, oh gosh, what was my second point going to be? Your question. Well, are we trying to give the business owners more flexibility? If we're going to the support areas, the darker gray there, right. um, what is making that more enticing to get the more support structure around the, the main thoroughfares? I'll tell you the truth. From a retail standpoint on Central Avenue, there's very little difference in okay. terms of the use of buildings. The biggest uh, change will be in the residential. Mm -hmm. Currently, we, we probably had close to a dozen applications go through planning commission for people to do upper floor, and in some cases in the fringe districts, um, street level residential. And we've had to take those through as use adjustments on a case by case. We had to hold public hearings 
and every single request that's ever been proposed for residential downtown has been approved by planning commission. That's usually a sign that we've got a problem with the zoning ordinance if we're constantly granting exceptions. So it will streamline that process. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public has an opportunity to uh, voice their opinions on the proposed changes. Is there anyone here that's in, like to speak in favor of council accepting these uh, development standard changes for the downtown? Okay. And uh, we just remind anybody who is to speak, just uh, need your name and address for the record. Good evening. My name is Adrienne Shear, and I have the We Can Business Incubator on 2 North Main Street. <clears throat> Other than that, unfortunately, I live in Monroe. But anyway, um, the Small Business Incubator has been in existence since 2001, and we have attempted to put many businesses in this district that we're talking about. And in many cases, it wasn't clear where they could be, where they couldn't be, then things were going to have to go through planning and zoning and get a variance, and people would just go, forget it. I'll just go to some place where they've already got all of this done. I am euphoric listening to Marty talk today because I know how much easier it is going to be for new small businesses to be right where we want them. Those of us in the incubator industry know that 87% of businesses stay where they started. So let's start them down here. I am very excited about this. A lot of people also have been interested in the past in making sure that they could live close to or above their business, have some food to eat, some activity around, and we haven't been able to provide that or have any idea when we could provide that in the past, and this is just one step in that direction. So I am in favor of this. There's a couple little things I would tweak if I were writing it, but I'm not. I'm just supporting it and saying good job in explaining it to us, Marty, and thank you for uh, considering it for our next hearing. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? In